welcome to the 25th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday the 14th of August and in this episode we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also talk about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu <laughs> community. If you're listening or watching live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan and joining me this week are Laura. Hiya. Hello. How are you? You alright? Good, thank you. Uh, Mark. Hello. How are you? I'm visible. <laughs> <laughs> Unusually. And Tony. Hello, Alan. How are you doing? Yeah, tickety-boo. Good, 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 good. That's what I like to hear. Yes. So you may or may not be aware that we're um, we're live on YouTube. We are yeah. hanging out. Yes, we are hanging on out. On YouTube. We hanging have to stop there. Alan from looking at himself on his monitor now. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Tony. Uh, uh, and uh, the idea is... Uh, You'll be able to see download or see this later on YouTube, but um, yes, it's a bit experimental this time <laughs> yeah. around. Um, we think we've got it all working, but we shall see. Yeah, thanks to the nice people at BT who've given me lots more bandwidth. Internet. Yes, <laughs> so yeah, tell us what you think. Whether you you know, if you'd rather not be subjected to our faces, we uh, we'd fully understand. Well, it's entirely optional. We don't actually have to <laughs> click the link. You can, you know. Not listen at all. That's yeah. fine. Please and in don't. Fact, many people Please will choose that option. Um, <laughs> in fact, the majority of people in the world do that already. Yes. Shall we get on with the show? Okay. And now it's time for the news. And first up this week, Jean-Baptiste Aquero, maintainer of the Android Open Source Project, has left the project in a huff. Mm. <laughs> no, <laughs> was it sorry, really that, in a huff? That, that was a bit unfair. No, he's Why he... can't he get a British car? <laughs> hey. What? It's an old joke. Okay. Right. Um, so, yes, he basically um, posted a message on Google+, Plus announcing that he was leaving the project over problems with the new Nexus 7, which has a, um, a Qualcomm graphics processor which requires uh, a nice old proprietary, proprietary blob. binary blob right. to power it which means there is no android open source image which can boot the nexus 7 which is supposed to be the flagship device isn't that isn't that the same for most android devices aren't there bi binary blobs for gpus and all kinds of bits and um, pieces apparently not i think i think the other the the, the nexus 1 is it was in the same situation but i think in between the Nexus 1 and the new Nexus 7, all of the graphics cards have had a sufficiently open GPU driver that they've been able to have a, a an at least reasonably open source release. Is anyone stepping up to take over? Um, I don't know. You'd hope mm. so. It's a shame, really, because he did say he flagged it up to the management at Google, you know, a good six months out yeah. that this issue was going to come. And then he got a load of flack for it that wasn't really his fault because he did what he was supposed to do. Um, and so he felt he his position was untenable, as they say. Yes. And, um, yeah, I had to leave. Yes. He said, there's no point in being the maintainer of an operating system that can't boot to the home screen on its flagship device for lack of GPU support. Yes. And also, Android isn't alone. I mean, <laughs> there aren't that many... Uh, Linux laptops that don't need some sort of proprietary binder to work in some way, whether it's graphics or wireless or something. There's the Lilu that uh, Richard Stallman uses. Does yes. he still use that? Uh, I actually saw him talk a few weeks ago. I should have asked him, but, um, you know, he was well, too busy dressing up as strange things. Yeah, it's it's sad that actually, the, you know, this still is this state of play. Um, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. It doesn't seem to be getting a lot worse. There are still lots of proprietary devices out there. Mm. Um yeah, very sad. Yes. In other news, LavaBit, the US-based secure email service, has shut down. Uh, LavaBit was apparently used by Edward Snowden, the whistleblower or traitor, depending upon your point of view, <laughs> uh, to speak um, uh, using an encrypted method to journalists. Uh, and uh, the uh, guy who ran LavaBit said, uh, I've been forced to make a difficult decision to become complicit in comp crimes against the American people or walk away from nearly 10 years of hard work by shutting down love a bit. Mm. Yeah. So basically what's, what is sort of implied is that a US government agency has sent him one of their special national security letters saying we need to seize some information from your systems and you're not allowed to tell anybody about it. So yeah, and he can't even he, he can't even tell anyone which yeah. agency he, he can't sent... tell them which agency he can't actually say that it's happened. 
um, he can just say that he'd rather close down the company than comply with whatever it is he may or may not have been asked to do, basically. Otherwise, he gets locked up for revealing this has happened, which is really quite bad. It is. And it also gets very complicated because the only employee of the company is somebody in Finland, I think, certainly in, in Europe. Mm. You know, he's the only full-time employee of the company, and there's obviously maybe a few other people who kind of do part-time or whatever. Mm. So he couldn't even tell his employee about this oh, right. this uh, re- alleged request from an alleged American security agency because of all the rules around that. So, because he was, you know, based in another country or whatever, I guess, or he, a foreign national. He also can't even tell his own lawyer some of it. The uh, He was interviewed on um, uh, Democracy Now!, a channel in the States, and uh, he was sat there next to his lawyer and did the usual, you know, every so often looking across at my his lawyer, can I say that, right. can I talk about that, can I talk about that? And there are a couple of occasions where he said, I, you know, I can't talk about that. Or the lawyer said, I don't think it's a good idea. We talk about that. Um, and on one occasion he said, look, there's stuff that I can't even tell him. <laughs> which just seems... And this, re- is, this is a country crazy. which is supposed to have constitutionally protected freedom of speech. Yeah. 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 He did say, I would strongly recommend against anyone trusting their private data to a company with physical ties to the United States. And when, when he was asked in this interview, um, would you... Um, set lava bit up again in another country mm. uh, he said uh well no because it wouldn't it wouldn't make much difference because i'm still a u.s citizen right. even if it, even if he rented servers in you know wherever like um somewhere that doesn't have an extradition treaty it wouldn't do him any good because he's american he's bound by the american laws and they could just come after him anyway so he'd have to emigrate and live yes. in whatever uh, yes data haven um i hear it's nice in service. russia this time yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, let's not go into that. <laughs> and <only laughs> nice for some people, yeah. not so nice for others. Yeah. What was the, happened to Sealand? They were going to turn that into a data oh, yes. haven. There was a they? fire. Oh. It mostly burnt down. Mm. Mm. That's, That's not suspicious. That at was all. like an offshore platform that they yes. were going to turn into a data haven. It was invaded haven. once. A guy, a German businessman, turned up with a helicopter and a gun, and they didn't have any guns. <laughs> And then they flew off to England and bought more guns than he had and kicked him off again. <laughs> Great story. Brilliant. Awesome. Well, if you are con- so continuing to be concerned about the security of your email in-, in the light of all of the NSA revelations, you might be interested to know about MailPile, which is a crowdfunded project for a free software self-hosted webmail system. Um, so it's being touted as a replacement for Gmail or Hotmail or all of the other compromised mail services that are out there. <laughs> Um, but it includes easy-to-use PGP uh, encryption, so you can make sure your emails are only read by the people you intend, mm-hmm. uh, and that they're presumably assigned as well. So this isn't, by the sound of it, they're not planning on making this a full-blown sort of mail server as well at the moment. It's, it's you know, a webmail client, a bit like Roundcube, that you, you can install on your own system. Yes, exactly. So quite why it differs from something like Roundcube, yeah. other than perhaps the integration with PGP, I'm well, not sure. What, what they're talking about is that they're going to make PGP just um, a sort of um, a deeply ingrained part of the interface and the workflow of sending an email. So rather than having to have like Enigmail plug in and setting stuff up like you would in Thunderbird, it's just it's the sort of default way of sending mm. email is to do signatures and encryptions with PGP. Yeah. The argument, of course, is the only way to be sure that your email is not getting read is to do PGP encryption. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, anything that goes through a big ISP's email servers is probably exactly. going to be logged and scanned, or could be anyway. Mm. And the, the other thing with this is you're going to have to find um, an email provider whose servers, well, an email provider with, with who doesn't have physical ties to the United States yeah. and who isn't just you know renting some server space from Amazon, perhaps, or anything like that. So you might have to rent your own VPS in a data center where you know where it is to put to store your email there and run your, your mail server there. Otherwise, the whole thing falls down because people can just subpoena the company and take all of their data, which is your data. I hear oh. Russia's nice this time. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a guy called um, a, a prominent um, privacy advocate who we've mentioned previously who asked if um, Ubuntu could switch to a different... Uh, search engine he asked us if we could switch from um google to something at start page that was it alexander hamp and uh, he's been uh, touting a, a privacy enabled browser he's been trying to get off the ground which right. which is basically a, a port a fork of um firefox and or chromium which has loads of 
um, plugins and, and like things. The, the Tor browser. Yeah, like Tor browser, which has all the necessary bits enabled so that it's secure out of the box, yeah. rather, rather than you having to faff around adding loads of stuff, which sounds similar to this mail pile where you know it's 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 secure from mm. the get go. Sounds a bit like Flock as well with Firefox, where they just tried to add a load of stuff in by default that wasn't there and that didn't work out very well but you know who knows these enlightened times maybe people will be more interested mm. but yeah the the um the campaign for um mail pile is looking quite good they've raised um, quite a bit of their target with i think they've got about um about four weeks left to go and they've probably raised about two-thirds of their target so that's looking quite positive mm. for them brilliant they could give canonical a few tips <laughs> <laughs> The two Arduino based satellites have been delivered to the International Space Station, which sounds rather cool. Mm. Um, it was also partly crowdfunded um, from people wanting to run experiments using the array of sensors, and there's a whole shed load of sensors on there. Um, and eventually they'll, or, well, they'll orbit for about a week before they burn up on re entry. I like that one of the uh, sensors in amongst the list is a wave sensor, wave detector. Uh, I'm guessing that's not a. Uh, uh, sea, a Google wave a detector. Sea, a sea wave detector. Oh, no. It's, it's oh, a, it's a electromagnetic it's, wave detector. Okay. okay. So when it flies over the sky, as it has been doing this week yeah. in the everybody UK, waves everybody it. waves at it and they can detect it and go, oh, look. Fred's yeah, that waving. sounds more plausible. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Excellent. So these are all, they've taken a Raspberry Pi and they've added these sensors Arduino, on. Arduino, I think. Arduino. Sorry, Arduino. Arduino and added all yeah. these sensors onto it and bundled it up into a box, sent it into space, and then they're going to drop it back down to Earth. Well, it's not. I don't think it's going to get back down to Earth. Yeah, well, yeah. towards Earth. Towards Earth. <laughs> let it go towards <laughs> Earth. Yes. <laughs> Open the window. They lean out. They go, One, two, three. Let yes. Go. Rather than pushing it out further into space, I guess yeah. is my point. That's correct. Sounds interesting. Because yeah, they don't have any. I think they've got solar panels on to power the instruments, but they don't have any propulsion. So they just float about a bit till gravity. Um, Take that inevitable natural, course. natural downward propulsion. So I guess they've got a transmitter on there to send the data as they're receiving it. Uh, presumably. I hope otherwise, so. <laughs> when it burns up, otherwise it'll yes. be a huge but, waste of time and yeah. effort. That will, I imagine, be one of the solar-powered things. Right, yes. <laughs> Excellent. A team of Russian developers uh, is selling a Linux-based malware program called Hand of Thief, which can capture banking details entered into your browser. Oh dear! Yes. Um, so yeah, there, there's this big story that um, it can. It's not just one Linux distribution. It can run on lots of different Linux distributions and different um, different desktop environments and so on. Um, although at the moment there's no, it doesn't actually seem that it's a virus in the traditional sense of being a self-replicating program. Right. It's basically some malware which you can buy from these developers and then somehow In install on your yeah, own computer exactly somehow <laughs> somehow convince people that they want to install it by a social engineering which is quite a common tactic anyway in terms of windows um, yes malware isn't it yeah that's true so yeah. but it's a, yeah i mean whether you can convince people to um open a, a, a debian package that's attached to an email well, there was a little while ago um, a bit of malware in um, a Debian package. I think it was a Debian package, which purported to have um, theme in it, I think, or, or um, wallpapers. Right. Right. It, was a, it was something along those lines. And it had some something dodgy in there that was classed as malware. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility to get a Linux user um, given there's so many of them of varying skill levels. They're not all, mm -hmm. you know, hyper... Uh, paranoid people who will you know um, only install debs from the archive where they're signed with a gpg key yeah. there, there are people out there who will install this kind of stuff so i don't think it's unreasonable to think that people, you can get people um socially engineer people to click these links yeah oh, i'm sure that you can always find enough people who would do it without thinking and, and then get got indeed in other news elementary os luna has been released uh, there's a CD available for order for ten dollars, uh, or you can pay what you want to uh, to download it. Um, cool. Does that include nothing? Uh, yes, I think it does. Brill. I think it does. Um, and they've they've already had lots of people give them some money for the work that they've done. Uh, it's very pretty. Um, mm. it, uh, there, there's been a lot of comments that it looks very much like OS X, which is nice that someone's pointing the finger at other people looking like <laughs> yeah. OS X for a change. Um, but yeah, they had a whole um, 
uh, announcement that was done as a as a hangout. Oh, um, cool. A couple of their guys uh, sat on a hangout and had they had a timer on their website decreasing. It was quite amusing because they went through the whole thing that that we had with um, with the edge in that uh, someone found some assets on our website and put them public <laughs> and said, "Look, this is what the edge is going to look like before we announced anything." Nice. Um, and uh, they've had they had the same kind of thing like people putting out announcements and saying look I can see that. and they were all over their website you know getting rid of you know hiding stuff again so that people couldn't see it but anyway that aside yeah looks really pretty it's got uh, fairly favourable reviews mm. yeah uh, well we interviewed nice. one of the developers on this show a few weeks ago didn't we yeah was that Daniel I think. Uh, yes that rings a bell yeah um, yeah. So it's uh, nice to see that kind of actually now being released because at the time they were like, we'll release it when it's ready. Yeah. Um, and now it is yeah. ready, apparently. Yeah. And interestingly, the CDs were ready on uh, on the release day. They actually, oh, wow. uh, they they had the um, the image that they've been testing. That was their final image they've been mm. testing for so long. Mm. But they had enough time to get some CDs pressed, as cool. I understand it. Um, and uh, Cassidy, one of the guys on the um, on the Hangout, was you know holding up a CD and saying, "Look, this is the CD." And it was cool. all nicely Brilliant. printed with their font. And oh, they've got they've got quite a nice little sort of promotional video on the on the the homepage as well, which is a bit of a, a sort of yeah um, a take on the old "I'm a Mac, I'm a PC" sort of. You know, the, you know, you see the adverts for, you know, I'm a, a musician and I like using Windows 7 because it's amazing. Or I'm a photographer and I use a Mac because I look at all this. of these apps. And, yeah, that, those sorts of things. So mm. it's one of those saying, I do lots of different things with my computer. And finally, ZTE, the company producing the first Firefox OS phone, has announced that the phone will be available to the UK market. Is it the first one? It says in this document that it's the first, and that's what I believe. <laughs> the phones will be sold exclusively through the company's eBay shop, and uh, the reported cost will be $80, which is going to be strange because it's a UK shop. Um, it's a US as well. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So it's about 60 quid in British money, and um, yeah, it sounds like you can send a reasonable chance of getting your hands on one. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Go and try it out. 60 mm. quid, can't argue with that. Cheaper than the Ubuntu H. There it is. <laughs> The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing more quizzes and now it's time for some community news and events excellent so first up the ubuntu app showdown has been launched so it's competition to make an app for ubuntu touch and win prizes what are the prizes mark uh you can win a nexus 4 with ubuntu touch pre-installed and um the winning app the willing developers get to work with the um, the Ubuntu engineering and design teams to get their app really nicely polished so it can go on the sort of final um, image of Ubuntu Touch, which is going to be used on actual phones. Ah, oh, okay. So, so hopefully like this will be what the, the image that OEMs are picking up and putting on their phones, which they release. Brilliant. And, you know, the Ubuntu Edge and similar devices. Yes. Um, so uh, is there a deadline for this? The deadline? <laughs> Funny you should ask that, Tony. The deadline <laughs> is the 15th of September. Cool. Um, right. Oh, there's there's two categories. So there's there's one winner for the best new app, which is developed specifically for Ubuntu Touch, and there's another one for the best ported app. So if you've got okay. an app on another platform which you want to port to Ubuntu Touch, then you can win a prize for that as well. And this isn't the first app showdown we've had, is it? I don't think so. Alan? Correct. <laughs> There has been another app showdown in the past where uh, the the goal was to make you know apps for for Ubuntu desktop. Uh, this predates Ubuntu Touch, and um, the apps. I think there was uh, we we talked about the winners and uh, on this show, in fact, ah. um, and I can't remember what they were. But the oh, the winner was I think oh, light read. A, a light read, an RSS reader. Yes, um, and they all went into the the app store. Um, or some of them went into the app store. Um, there was a bit of controversy about the uh, the previous one in that uh, there was um, a lot more uh, people entered the uh, the the app showdown than was anticipated. Right. <laughs> so judging became a bit of a burden, did it? 
I'm not sure if, ju- well, yeah, I'm sure judging was a burden, but the whole process was a burden. I think right. there was a, you know, because of the um, the process around getting apps into the Ubuntu Software Center, hmm. um, is it was quite heavyweight, and it would um, involve um, you submitting your application and then um, waiting for someone to do some packaging and maybe reviewing, and we had a limited number of people doing that work, and that, you know, so, so it ended up bottlenecking on the ARB application review board as I understand it um, and that's part of the reason why they're redeveloping the whole um, application like uh, packaging life cycle of how you get apps into the store and and that's part of the reason why this whole click package thing was developed so that mm. the, the packages can be uh, tested automatically rather than having to go through a human being to to test them out and um, you know get them ready and review them before they go into the store. Well, we should try to talk to somebody who's got experience of trying to get an app into the current software center and uh, see how that easy that was for him, maybe. Smooth. Yeah. <laughs> More well, about that next could show. happen. Yes. Uh, in uh, uh, other interesting community news, uh, yes. the Ubuntu Edge has uh, dropped the uh, the um, price crowdfunding... <laughs> No, it's dropped, it's but it project. hasn't broken because it has a metallic <laughs> casing and, <laughs> and a sapphire, sapphire screen. screen. Yes, yes. Uh, no. <laughs> the the amount that uh, the minimum amount you have to back the campaign in order to get a uh, an Ubuntu Edge has dropped to six nine five dollars. I think it is. Uh, it was Brilliant. there were tiered um, points. There was a originally on the first day there was a six hundred dollar, and then there was. Uh, 725 and it mm. went all the way up to 830 but uh, there's been a post on the Indiegogo uh, stating that uh, due to uh, interest from the industry mm. with no details about who in the industry that might be um, they've been able to reduce the price down and set it permanently at 695 so basically the alluded the to the fact that um, the, the supplier they'd be able to get the the stuff they needed cheaper than they thought so they'd so be a, able to make it for a, a lower price there's a a supply of uh sapphire falling yes. off the back of a lorry yes. somewhere yeah. that's going to be used in the making of this phone yeah somewhere in the vicinity of the isle of man <laughs> and, and we <laughs> uh, and uh, it washed up on the shore of the isle of man yeah uh, and we've just passed 10 million it's at 10.07 million at wow. the moment Brill. Yes, still got twenty two million to go and eight eight days to do it. Well, well it, it could happen. There tends to be a peak at the end of crowdfunding campaigns, doesn't there? Yeah, yeah I don't know if any campaign has peaked to the value of twenty two million in the last day, but you know, uh, ever the optimist. You yeah, know, we like to push yeah, the boundaries. We'll see how that goes. Well, oh. right now, basically, if you want to pay your credit card company some money, you can do that by backing Ubuntu Edge. And then when they refund you the uh, pledge, you can just pay the credit card company the interest that you've incurred for that cost. Or you could keep that <laughs> or you could keep that money in your PayPal account and, you know, use it as, I don't know, wife don't know money or something. I don't know. Well, whatever you do, Alan, is up to you. Um, <laughs> but Mark Tuttleworth has said rather interestingly that actually it is already making a difference and that it's shown that there's a huge amount of interest and even though it might might not slash won't uh, reach its target, um, it's, it's it's got a hell of a lot of publicity for Ubuntu and for Ubuntu Phone and, and for Mark for Shuttleworth <laughs> and for Mark Shuttleworth. So it's it served a good purpose, even if it hasn't actually going to result in a uh, in a, a physical device at the end of it all. Xmere is now available in the saucy Salamander app repositories. For fans of graphical display systems, Xmere is the replacement for something like Wayland. <laughs> Not quite. Which is the replacement oh, for X- Xmere. Is the, Xmere is the compatibility bit that lets X apps run on Mir. So you well can done. still use all of your, your favourite Firefoxes and Open Offices and every other application in the repository um, with a GUI uh, on Mir. So this is essentially, congratulations, we've unbroken the thing that we broke when we replaced X. No, not quite. Not, uh, oh, it's not. No, it's not because fixed. Mir isn't. Uh, no, because uh, no. Right. <laughs> but totally so, so sorry, sorry. Just to get just so I'm straight here. Saucy Salamander is the current development release. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if you're running the development release, then you can now try it out. Mm. Excellent. Do that. Brian Murray has blogged about introducing phased upgrades to allow gradual deployment of stable release updates while checking for regressions. What's all that about? So a stable release update is where they 
release uh, an update for a package that's in an LTS so that it's got you know the latest security fixes and bug fixes mm. and features which it otherwise sorry it will get security fixes anyway but they, like if they want to really um provide a particular new version which you wouldn't otherwise get because it's an LTS they can do a stable release update and this um new phased thing phased deployment um lets them push it out to say 10% of people they'll get the update and then they can keep an eye out um at the crash reports and check that it's not introduced a regression and then they can push it out to the next 10% to the next 10% and so on rather than pushing it out to everyone finding there's a problem and then going oh god what do we do now and i understand from the post it's actually all fairly automated the uh, the increase yeah, because it's, so, it sounds like it's actually been in the update manager for a hmm. long time they've just not had the server side end of it working so it monitors errors.ubuntu.com and if there is not a significant increase in the errors being reported hmm. related to the package that they are deploying the sru for then it'll bump it up to the next 10 percent um so it's kind of you it's know quite clever doing getting your users to do your testing for you in a way yes um but it's probably better than sending out something that's broken to everybody yeah and you can you can override it if you actually want to do the updates um and you you don't want to wait to find out if you're one of the 10 percent of people who are getting that update or not you just drop to the command line use app get and and you'll you'll get all the updates it, it only applies right. to doing uh updates with right, update manager yeah okay. software updater <laughs> yes. yes that thing um, Go on, there's some good news about Firefox, I think, Alan. You've got uh, oh, right, some yes. there for us. Yes, good news, Firefox fans. It will still be the default in 13.10 and will not be replaced as the default by Chromium, as was suggested by Jason Warner and discussed at length on the Ubuntu Devil. So what were the arguments list. for changing to Chromium? Um, well, it's difficult. There weren't really any concrete arguments that I could see given in either direction. It was mostly... I prefer Firefox. No, I prefer Chromium. Oh, well, there that, were, there that were, sounds very sensible. You know, yeah, it, it was a bit difficult. Um, uh, and you To know. be honest, I didn't imagine that there would be any more concrete arguments than <laughs> that. It does just seem to be, you know, personal, personal choice. preference, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that, um, you know, one or other has a bigger development team or one or the other is more committed to openness or, you know, there, there are there are factors you could use to make your decision, um, but um, at the moment it's gonna, don't fix mm. it. Well, yeah, at the moment. Although uh, Jason and Rick did say, you know, we'll reevaluate this for fourteen oh four. So I is this is this they suggested it and the and the decision was no. So they said, oh, we'll, we'll ask again and we might get the answer we wanted. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, given that's exactly what happened with uh, Banshee and Rhythmbox, yeah. it's not it's not a case of asking the same question over and over again. It's a case of reevaluating the right, default okay. set of applications every release, yes. which we do every release anyway. So the, you know, it's just part of the normal process of building the uh, list of packages that are going to be in the next release. It happens every time. And finally, Ars Technica has had an interview with Mr. Mark Shuttleworth talking about Canonical, his investment in it, and its general lack of profitability. Um, the interview is really worth uh, reading, actually. Yeah. It's a couple of pages long, but it's very um, interesting and kind of seems very unguarded. Yeah, and it's quite, quite unusual because there's always been this sort of this elephant in the room around the fact that Mark Shuttleworth piles lots of money into Canonical and it doesn't necessarily make him any back. Yeah. And, you know, what's his motivation for doing this? And he actually goes into, you know, looking at the, the company and what what it is that interests, interests him in doing it, which is basically he wants to do something which is interesting and disruptive. Yes. Um, he's certainly done that. He's mm. certainly done that. Um, and, you know, he's he says that if he just spun out the, the sort of server bit of the company, then that would probably be profitable in itself. But, because, you know, he doesn't because he wants to do all this other stuff. He wants to own everything, not just the server. Well, he, he says that basically, um, you know, he wants there to be a successful desktop, but he doesn't think it's possible in this day and age for there to be a successful desktop without a successful mobile platform accompanying it. So he's got to build that. Otherwise, mm. the desktop is going nowhere. 
Yes, so well worth reading. We'll put a link to that in the show notes, so go along and uh, have a look at that. And we've got some events to tell you about now. Alan? We certainly do. We have BikeOn UK, which is the UK Python conference uh, in... I've decoded that for you. There, yeah. uh, in Coventry from the 20th to the 23rd of September, uh, as well as technical talks and tutorials, PyCon UK has developed a significant education track over the years. And this year there'll be a number of teachers and pupils attending. See more at PyConUK.org. Ohio Linux Fest is happening on the 13th to 15th of September. And part of Ohio Linux Fest is HubuCon. Take it away, Tony. And we're back. Yes, after a year off, Ubuntu Ohio returns to present a new VuCon at Ohio Linux Fest. Catch us on Friday, September 13th at the Greater Columbus Convention Center. No, it isn't Odd Camp America, but it is how we roll here in the Buckeye State. Register for Ohio Linux Fest at ohiolinux.org. Remember, that's O-H-I-O. We'll be seeing you. There we go. Yes, and speaking of Odd Camp... Yes, Hog Camp is happening at the uh, on the nineteenth and twentieth of October at LJMU in Liverpool, and you can finally come because we've <laughs> released the tickets. <laughs> yes, uh, the website is launched. There are tickets available. People can book them and come to yes. the event. And... Oh, interesting thing about the tickets this year: you can mm. pay for them. Yes, if you want, you don't have to. Yes, so we... we've we've introduced a a pay what you want, including nothing. Are we model. expecting thirty two million? Yeah. <laughs> we don't we don't need 32 million basically we thought it would be nice to try a, a slightly different model of um of funding the event because yeah. normally we fund it um, largely through sponsorship um but basically we realized we didn't need as much sponsorship this year so we thought we'd see what other um what other options were available to us um, and there's actually been pretty uh, astonishing response yeah it's been great there have always been a lot of people who've said to us i'd like to donate to support odd camp i'd like to make it happen um so this is a good way for people who want to do that to do that yeah you can still get a ticket for absolutely nothing and come along and we'd still love to see you there um and the people who pay don't get any more privileges nope. but if you want to give us a few quid to help the running of the event please do so chuck it in the virtual bucket um the other thing to, to let you know about is that the accommodation info is up on the website there's no official hotel this year um but if you are planning on coming have a look quite quickly because the hotels are booking up um yes. apparently uh, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i tried two or three and they were all kind of booked oh, wow. out mm. over those three nights but maybe yeah, there, if you're there's there. plenty of hotels in liverpool and there's you know posh hotels and there's mm. hostels if you really want to do it on the cheap and there's the adelphi way we stayed last year yes. if you're glutton for punishment but if you want to get a clean one make sure you book early um <laughs> we are confirming speakers at the moment mark is busy writing to people and emailing people yes if there's if there's uh, you know someone who either from the community or from the wider sort of free culture sphere who you think would be good to see on the scheduled track this year do let us know yeah, we'd be delighted to hear from you. And if you are interested in sponsoring us or giving us prizes for the raffle, yes. you can email Mr. Dan Lynch. That's dan at sixgun.org. And uh, he'll be waiting for your email. And if you want to speak at Old Camp, just come along with your talk. And that's what it's there for. Yeah, it's an unconference. You make the talks. You give the talks. You're all part of it. It's nothing without you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this episode. Join us next time when we'll be interviewing Zane Swafford about how to fail at software. We'll be reading your feedback and making your life a little bit easier with some command line love. Mm, that, that wasn't <laughs> nice at all, was it? No, it sounded like there's a bit of phlegm in there. <laughs> so uh, those of you watching on live video, carry on watching. Those of you listening to the our audio live stream can carry on listening and you'll hear us. And Otherwise, if you download it, we'll see you next week. Exactly. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.